Well, thanks very much for inviting me here today to talk about the sanctuary and my experiences as an entrepreneur. When I was at business school in 1988, a long time ago in SEAD, um, they just started an elective on entrepreneurship. And at the time, it wasn't hugely popular. And it wasn't hugely popular because everybody wanted to be a management consultant or a banker or possibly go into industry. And at the time, I was a management consultant. I was being sponsored through business school by Bain, but what I really wanted to do was become an entrepreneur. So I was really excited when they started this course. The only problem with the course was to get onto the course, you had to have an idea. You had to have an idea for a startup. And uh, over the course of the elective, which was about six or seven weeks, you then worked on the idea, tested it, researched it, and then wrote a business plan. The only problem with that was I really struggled with coming up with an idea, a kind of big idea. And um, net result was I came up with a rather small idea, which after it went through the rigors of business planning and everything really didn't stack up to very much. And so I didn't do very well at all in my entrepreneurship elective when I was at business school. And so when I left business school, I went back into management consultancy and I really buried the idea of being an entrepreneur until I thought I'd found the idea. Uh, it took me another about 15 years before I became an entrepreneur, I suppose successful entrepreneur. Um, and I did that not by starting up a business. I took that, but I did it by taking a stake in a business, transforming the, a dated brand, declining business, the Sanctuary Spa, and then building the spa products in a mature category, a rather low tech category into the market leader. Essentially, it was about bubble bath and body butter. So I thought today I've been told to speak for about 30, 40 minutes and then 20 minutes of Q&A. So I thought I'd split my talk today into three parts. The first part, how I went from being a management consultant into an entrepreneur. And the path was by no means linear and planned. Rather unusually, I've sort of uh, flip-flopped, zigzagged backwards and forwards between corporate life and being an entrepreneur. The second part, I'll just talk about the sanctuary and what we did there to make it a success. And then finally, I'll spend some time on the lessons I've learned as an entrepreneur um, and what I think might be relevant to yourselves if you're starting out trying to uh, buy a business or start up a business. So 1988, I went back into uh, Bain & Company as a management consultant and I worked on everything from the hand dryer and hand towel market to acquisition for a career company in Asia through to the startup of Air Miles. But as I worked in management consultancy over the years, I increasingly became more frustrated with advising and consulting. And what I really wanted to do was run a business. I just didn't know quite how or where to go about finding a business. And then one night, a chance meeting was with um, the owners of a small optician, small fashion sunglasses brand called Cutler & Gross. It was an optician's in Knightsbridge. It was really small. And what they'd started doing was developing their own optical frames and sunglasses. And they started selling those in the shop and in some fashion stores. And what they found was that the fashion set started wearing them. And then pop stars started wearing them like you two. At the point when I met them, they said, well, I think we've got a good business. We're, we're growing it. We just, we, just, we just don't know how to scale it and scale it internationally. Uh, we're just the two of us here in Knightsbridge. And so we talked and I gave them some ideas. And then the next day, one of them called me up and said, why don't you come and do it? And I thought, it's better than consulting. And all the things inside me that would nowadays probably go, no, 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 don't do it. I gave up my job and I did it. And I, 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 start, I went to this small little office in, in Knightsbridge and decided that I'd be try and run this sunglasses business and build it. Now, in the 1990s, there weren't designer sunglasses. There were just two brands, Persol and Ray-Ban. And what I saw was an opportunity to build Cutler & Gross into a designer, a global luxury sunglasses brand. And I uh, didn't know how I was going to do it, but that's, that's why I, saw, I decided to make the leap, because I saw that potential. And so I negotiated a stake in the sunglasses business. I took a massive drop in salary, and I became MD. And um, I went into the business, and I pulled together some sunglasses into different fashion ranges. And then I created a brochure, and I went off to Harvey Nichols. 
and I sold into Harvey Nichols, I sold a range. And then I went off to Joseph and I went off to Jigsaw and managed to sell them in. And as I saw that they were selling through, I then decided to go and do the same in New York, in Chicago, in LA, and did the same in Milan and Paris. And, and much to my surprise, the business started taking off. We started selling, we started being featured in the glossy magazines in the, in the UK and in the States. And after 18 months, we made a quarter of a million pounds bottom line profit from nothing. And in those days, that was quite a lot of money, certainly a lot of money for me in those days. Um, and uh, really enjoyed it, it was great fun. And then as we were making this money, a lot of money, the owner suddenly turned to me and said, now we're making all this amount of money, how about we swap your equity for a larger salary? <laughs> and I said, um, oh, I don't want to do that, obviously. And, um, but I'd made one mistake. And the mistake I'd made was we'd negotiated what the deal was, but in my enthusiasm to get into the business and build it, I actually hadn't nailed the legal agreement. And so uh, those, I didn't really have much choice, and so I left. And so that was a huge lesson for me. And so for anybody here who's thinking about setting up a business with a friend, with a member of the family, a colleague, the one lesson I would give you is really sort out the terms of your partnership and get a legal agreement before you start. It's a lot easier. So I left Cutler and Gross and then um, I spent some time trying to, I got some backing and I went out to try and find another business to buy into. And I spent about a year trying to do this. And after a year, whilst I'd seen some businesses I quite liked, there was none that I actually could make an offer on and felt confident enough to buy. And so rather reluctantly, I took a job in marketing. I took a job at Guinness, which then became Diageo. Um, and um, I stayed there for about four or five years and I ended up being global brand director for Johnny Walker, which was a great job and a job I absolutely loved. Um, and then um, whilst doing that, I became pregnant, I had a child and after the birth of my first uh, baby, I decided that I didn't want to keep traveling internationally and spending my times in nightclubs and bars drinking Johnny Walker. And my next career move was then to go and manage one of the countries for, for Diageo. And I didn't want to do that job of going, moving every couple of years to a different country with my family in tow. So um, I gave, I reluctantly resigned and left Diageo. By this stage, it was the late 1990s. I left in December 99, uh, which was um, really the boom of the dot-com, the dot-com boom. And I left not knowing quite what I was gonna do next. Um, I thought I'd go back into a corporate job because I thought that would be much easier to manage having a family um, and do having a job with set hours. Um, and so uh, as I was thinking about jobs and going for interviews and things, I got approached by a headhunter to join this, this startup. And it was three guys from San Francisco, from Bain, San Francisco, and they were coming to London to set up uh, .com person-to-person uh, -person betting, which was, you know, their mission was to create the eBay of betting. And I thought this was a great business, a big business, a transformational business. And so I joined Flutter.com in January 2000. And then between January and April, we raised $38.5 million with no website. And uh, then we set about creating the business. The website, we scaled from six people to 60 people. Uh, we kept on recruiting consumers. Uh, we were growing. We weren't making any money, but we were sort of growing in people and in consumers. Um, but we had a competitor. We had a much better competitor. And the competitor had launched a month after we had. It was Betfair. And they had a better site, a better proposition. And so what we ended up doing after 18 months, two years, we ended up merging with Betfair. Um, Betfair ended up floating in 2010 for about just under 1.5 billion. Um, as I was looking through these speakers that have been to the Tell series, I realized that there was a speaker called Tim Levine. And Tim Levine came a couple of years ago, and he was also one of the early founding employees of um, Flutter, which merged with Betfair. So the Betfair story is a great story. I'm not going to cover it today. So, but if you're interested in the Betfair story, do look at um, Tim's video. Um, 
So then uh, once I'd uh, left Flutter, we left Flutter actually when I was nine months pregnant and we were about to merge with Betfair. And again, I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm going to have a baby. And so uh, just before I went to have my baby, I was invited to a dinner, a dinner held by a private equity company called HG Capital. And I ended up sitting next to the CEO. And the CEO said to me, well, what are you going to do next, Alice? And I said, I'm going to have a baby. I'm nine months pregnant. And um, he called me and he said uh, the next day, and he said, we've got an underperforming business here in our portfolio. We'd like you to take a look at it. Have you got time? And I said, a few weeks. I've got a few weeks. So um, the business was the Sanctuary Spa. It was in an old fund. It was turning over five million. It had no CEO. They hadn't spent any money on the business. And what HG wanted to know was, should we keep it and build it or should we just sell it? And um, I, uh, the, the, there was a chairwoman who had gone into the business who was um, from HG Capital. And together we looked at it and we thought it had potential. At the time, um, the sanctuary, I don't know if, do you, do you all know Sanctuary Spa? Sanctuary Spa, it was in Common Garden, 20,000 square feet, two pools, 43 treatment rooms, um, lounges, retail space. And the idea behind it was women would go there for the day and spend the day. It was women only. It was founded in 1978. And at the time was probably famous or infamous for being uh, for made, made famous by the film The Stud with Joan Collins. And Joan Collins was seen swinging across one of the pools and then it ended up in an orgy scene. So not, not a great, not gr it, was, it was famous, but not for the right reasons. And so by 2001, the spa was famous for that, but it was also looking very dated and very tired. And there was a whole new wave of spas that had set up like Bliss from New York. There was a Mandarin Oriental. And really it was quite difficult for the sanctuary to compete. And certainly none of the editors of any of the glossy magazines would even step inside it. But there was one thing that the sanctuary had that, that made it different from all of these other spas. And it was the fact that women could come there for the day. They felt really comfortable. There were no men. You could relax. You could take, spend time with a friend. And it was that that made us think that the spa had real potential. And so the chair and I decided to invest. I came on board as an NED. We then went out and we raised a million and a half pounds to then refurbish the spa. Uh, we decided not to recruit a CEO or an MD. And then over the next three years, between 2001 and 2004, we managed to grow the spa from 40,000 40, guests a year to 64,000 guests a year. We grew the revenue from 5 million to 8, and the bottom line profit from 0 to 2 million. And by that stage, we got some editorial coverage and the associations with the stud and Jane Collins and the orgy scene began to fade, not completely. Uh, and so by the summer of 2004, the spa was valued and it was valued at 17 million. So it was quite a quick time. And what we, what we basically did was we, we spent the one and a half million, we refurbished it, we brought it up to the same standards as lots of the other spas. So it looked luxurious and it was a pampering experience. But the key thing we did was we refocused the proposition for the sanctuary. We literally positioned it as a sanctuary, a place where women could come for the day and spend time and relax and, and recalibrate. And that was very different to the 60 minute single treatment kind of spas, the ones that focused on having a hip 100 pound facial treatment. We were very different. And the other thing we did was we positioned ourselves as accessible and inclusive. Whatever size, shape you were, you could come in. It didn't matter. And most of the spas at the time were very exclusive. And so those two things really differentiated ourselves uh, from the other spas. And it also helped us focus on what we should do to fix the, proper, the, the offer. Um, what we were trying to do is create an indulgent, pampering day experience. So what we did was we really focused on training. We trained all the staff to try and deliver five-star kind of service, the sort of thing that you'd see experience in an Asian five-star hotel. We changed all the treatments and brought them up to date. And then we completely changed the, the food offer. We had a rather sad, healthy salad bar. 
And what we thought was, if you're coming to spend the day with a friend here, you want to have something that's really indulgent, something really nice to eat. You don't want to have the really small chicken wing with the salad. So what we did was we put in really indulgent high-end dining and I introduced alcohol, I put champagne in. And that was quite unusual at the time for spas. And so that changed the whole experience. So what we were offering is, as women, you know, the gift of time, the time to spend with your friend, uh, with your friends, and be pampered and looked after. And the final thing we did was uh, changed all the marketing. We didn't have very much to spend, but what we did, we pulled together and decided to focus on marketing gift vouchers, and so, and, and market the gift vouchers at Christmas. So we took that little spend and we put it into posters in the tubes and onto radio. We created a brochure for, for gift vouchers and just focused on that. And it was doing that that transformed our business model and our profitability. And it transformed it because our business then got driven by gift vouchers. And everybody who has a gift voucher, 80% of them, you would bring a friend with them. So all our business then became pre-booked. So everybody who came, they booked, they booked in advance, they brought their friends with them, that really drove the sales. And that meant that rather than waiting for people to come through the door and be a drop-in business like most of the salons and spas, we became a business that you had to book. And as a result of that, we operated at 90% utilization of our therapists. And that was the key to driving the profitability of the business. At the same time as being NED of, of the sanctuary, I became uh, the marketing and e-commerce director for Marks and Spencers. So the way we, uh, my chair and I uh, operated the business, or ran the business, was that in the first six to nine months, whilst I was having the baby, um, we were in the business two, three times a week. We put in the main fixes into the business. And then after six, nine months, we recruited a spa director. And then both of us worked sort of two half days a month as NEDs to, to drive the business forward. Um, by the summer of 2004, we turned around the business, it was growing, it was profitable, and then HG Capital wanted to sell it. And what we proposed was, rather than sell it, was there was this little license business that they'd got, that a license had been granted to a third party in 1999 to develop spa <coughs> uh, products for sale in Boots. And what we said to HG was, you're going to leave money on the table if you sell the spa and you don't sell it together with the license. And so we thought it would take a couple of months to renegotiate the license and to buy it back, but it took a year. And over the course of the year, I looked more and more at the business and I thought, oh, actually it's quite a good business, we could do something with it. So um, in 2005, we managed to finally buy the license back, recapitalize the business, and then HG backed us to build the spa business. And the structure of the deal was that the business, the enterprise value was, was 23 million. We had 3 million of equity, 10 of senior debt, and 10 of loan stock. And at that point, I went in, gave up the corporate life, and went in as CEO. Over the course of the next three years, from 2005 to 2008, we grew, I grew the spa business, the spa products business. Um, and we ended up selling it to PZ Cousin for 75 million. At the time that we sold the business, the business was growing about 15% per annum. We'd managed to put a toehold into the States with our product line and some into Asia. And we did all of this, we grew the business. Oh, we were number one in the category and number two beauty brand at Boots. Whilst growing the business, we also managed to pay back 10 million of loan stock with all the interest and 4 million of senior debt with all the interest. And we did all of that by through the cash flow that we generated. So um, how do we do it? Um, the first thing we did was we had a really clear vision of, about what we were trying to do and a super simple business plan. And our aim was to be a 50 million retail brand in Boots, and we were about 30 at the time. We didn't quite get to 50, but it seemed like a good number to aim for. Uh, and the way we were gonna do that was by creating a brand. 
creating a brand that consumers really loved and felt emotionally connected to. And um, the brand, and the reason why we did that was it was an incredibly cluttered market. And the only way we thought we'd be able to stand out is by having a brand um, that people felt close to. So, and the brand, when we did some work on it, this, the very simple insight that we built the brand on was uh, an insight about women. Women are incredibly uh, busy, they live busy lives, they're under a lot, a lot of pressure. And the one thing they like to do is just to be able to have a little bit of me time, to be able to carve out that time for themselves. And so what we decided to do as a brand was recognize this, talk about it, give women permission to carve out me time for themselves. Sounds quite fluffy, but that's what the brand was based on. And it was because we built a brand, a brand that talked directly and powerfully to women, that we got the valuation that we did. If we were just selling bubble bath and body butter, we wouldn't have got a valuation of 70 million, 75 million. We'd have got something far less. So the brand was the real value driver and that we created the brand and made it within that three years before it was quite quite dated and quite tired, although the spa had, had recovered. The second thing we did was we focused on genuinely creating a better product. Um, we did this by, first of all, taking out all the slow selling lines, which I cut immediately about 30% of the SKUs that we had. I then focused on packaging, packaging so that it looked luxurious, so that it looked as good as a department store brand. It had great standout, shelf standout, and it had great bathroom appeal. And the third thing we did were, I did was invest quite heavily in innovation. So that by the time we sold the business, 30% of our lines every year were new. <coughs> and what we aim to do is we aim to match the quality and have far quicker and better innovation than department store brands, whether it's Origins, whether it's Molten Brown, and we aim to deliver that with formulations and packaging for about half the price within a mass environment. So we were in this new category emerging called Mastige. Um, and, then the f so, and then the fourth thing we, we did was we didn't have huge budgets for building the brand. In fact, we had very little budgets for building the brands. And the two things that we focused on to try and get visibility was PR and recommendations by beauty editors. And because we had a constant stream of innovation, we had a constant reason to go back to the press and go, hey, look at our new product. And we'd get lots of features within, uh, within the press. And the other thing we did was focus absolutely uh, on how our product looked within the store and getting visibility within store. And when we did beauty gifts, <coughs> we ended up having a huge amount of the real estate within store uh, devoted to Christmas gifts, but our Christmas <coughs> gifts were no longer little boxes with plastic windows. We started creating hat boxes and bags and lots of different things so that we, so when you went into the store at Christmas, you'd see a huge amount of the sanctuary product. And it looked luxurious and it looked, it looked premium. And then the final thing I did, and probably the single most important thing, was create a team. Because I'd acquired a, a license back, I'd acquired a virtual business. I had no team. So I had to recruit everybody from scratch. And I erred on the side of over-recruiting for all the key roles and having fewer people. So the spa side of the business, the spa product side of the business, as opposed to the spa, all of that was run with just 10 people but the 10 were very, very good. And that's really what drove the success. So I think I will end with some of the key lessons that um, I've learned from being an entrepreneur that might be relevant to you all. I think the number one thing that I've learned on my journey of becoming an entrepreneur is you don't necessarily need to wait for the big idea to be a successful entrepreneur. You can look for opportunities in businesses, in industries that you know. You can be successful by creating a better product, targeting a specific niche consumer, offering a premium service, offering a cheaper product through running a leaner operation. At Sanctuary, we launched into a mature, no growth market with loads of competitors, but we targeted a niche 
with a better product, a more premium product, and we created a brand. The second thing um, I, I would, the second lesson I learned was find a partner. It could be your CFO, it could be your chair, it could be your co-founder. And find a partner who complements your skills and will challenge you and support you. If you want to go for VC or private equity backing, it also makes you much more backable. In my case, my partner was my chair. She was an accountant by background and had spent several years in private equity. And she was strong in all the areas that I was weak. And she was also an excellent sounding board. And when we did have crises, and we did have crises, uh, she was a fantastic support. Um, next thing is people. Hire the very best people that you can for your key roles, especially if you don't understand or have much experience of that industry. Hire the very best people that you can. Tell them what, you, what part they would play in building the business. Motivate and then incentivize them with equity. My, my belief is that you can transform a B plus business with a great team and you can transform it into an A grade business. And every single one person in, in my uh, small team was over recruited <coughs> for the role and they all played a very key part in the success of the business. And to recruit, or you, by all means sort of rely on headhunters, but I find the best way to find the very best people is to network and to network in the industry to find out who are the good people, who are the people who work at your retailers, who are the best, who are the best people in this category. And it's those people that you want. Use your own networks. It's those people that you want. And it also, certainly for me, it was important because I'd never made bath and body products. I'd never been in this industry. I'd never sold bath and body products, any personal care products. So getting people who were the very best in the industry enabled me to get up to speed and also made sure that I wasn't making any stupid mistakes. As a management consultant, I always thought that getting the right strategy was the key to success in a business. Um, I certainly, at, uh, at Sanctuary, the strategy was really quite the easy part. The difficult part was actually to execute the strategy flawlessly. So, what I learned was you need to be obsessive and you need to be obsessive about your execution. And we were obsessive. We were obsessive about product. We were obsessive about marketing. We were obsessive about our cost and we were obsessive about cash. So every Monday morning, I would get the retail sales data from Boots and I would look at a SKU level with my team about how every single SKU was performing. And I'd see how it performed versus the category. And then before the meeting, the sales director would get any intelligence on who was doing well in the category. And from that Monday meeting on trading, we would learn how our products were performing, whether there were products that were doing very well or products that were not doing very badly. That had an implication for stock. We'd learn what was working about our marketing. We'd learn what was working about our promotions. If we lost share in a week, we'd want to know what was working about our competitive products. Was there a product that was out there that was going to fly, that we hadn't got a product that was similar? Was there something that they were doing with PR or marketing or promotion or even space in store that we hadn't done? So we learned as a team in that trading meeting. And as a result of that, that would trigger immediately ideas for new product development. It would trigger changes in marketing. It would trigger changes in promotional activity. The second thing we'd do is on a Tuesday, we would have a product meeting every single week. And in the product meeting, because we had such a huge amount of innovation, what we would do is we would look at uh, where we were in terms of the ability to deliver on time, each of the SKUs that were in the pipeline, and also be able to deliver to the cost that we needed to achieve the gross margin that we needed. And in that meeting, we had sales, operations, finance, marketing. And what we didn't have was long decision making. We made decisions in that meeting. We didn't have long processes. We made decisions in that meeting. So it's quite fiery, product might want to, something to continue. Um, supply chain would say, you're never going to get it for that price. You're never going to be able to make that gross margin. And that meant we were quite fleet of foot. The biggest thing we had to make was what not to launch. 
because if we launched a product and it was unsuccessful, we'd be left with a whole a lot of stock. And so what we tried to do is we needed to ensure that we innovated enough. And you're always going to fail when you innovate. What we wanted to do was reduce the downside of failure, which is the cost of failure, which is the huge amount of stock that you put out there. So what we did was we had a really simple system. What we did was that we would, on all our launch, all our products, we would test every single product blind against our competitor benchmarks. And unless the product performed better than the competitor benchmarks, and a lot of them were prestige benchmarks, and on top of that scored more than a seven and a half out of 10, we wouldn't launch it. And there was lots of arguments about, no, no, it's a great product, but we wouldn't launch it. And what that gave me was certainty that the product was genuinely better than the competitors. So whatever marketing you put around it, I know that when the product was in use, that people would appreciate it, like it, and think it's better and superior. The final thing, um, cash. Everybody's probably talked to you about cash in these tell series. Um, before um, running a business, I always used to focus on sales and profit. When you're in a leverage business, when you're in a startup, cash is really important. And it also changes some of your behavior, and it changes the way you look at a business. And one of the key things that we did with ca because of our focus on cash flow was I re-engineered the supply chain. I re-engineered the supply chain so that on all our core SKUs, we could operate on the minimum amount of stock. And by doing that, I was able to take two million out of working capital. We're only a business, we're a you know, relatively small business, two million out of working capital. And by taking the two million out of working capital, I was able to pay back two million of loan stock. And the next thing I did, which is very different from when you work in a large company, is when the retailer comes and says, mm, we're gonna change your payment terms. We're not gonna pay you on time. I absolutely held the line and negotiated. And that's not something that I think I would have done if I was in a large company. Um, and then the very final thing is you need luck. There is a huge element of luck. I was very lucky to find this opportunity. I was lucky, very lucky to have the chair that I did. I was extremely lucky to find the core team for running the Sanctuary products. And probably the best bit of luck was the timing for sale. It was sold in 2008, just before the crash. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's probably the biggest piece of luck. Um, but we also had bad luck. And you probably, if you go and run your own businesses, you'll have setbacks, things won't go to plan. You'll have some bad luck. And when you have bad luck, you need to dig deep in terms of your resilience and your dogged optimism to get you through it. And I'll just tell you the little bit of bad luck that we had in the first six months. So in the first six months, we were hit by two, not one, two national disasters. The day that we transacted to buy the license business back was 7-7-2005, the day of the London bombings. So for my first day as CEO of the business, I lost half of all of the bookings in the spa for the following week because people wouldn't come into London. <coughs> then over the course of the next three months, I lost 30% of all of the bookings for the spa and it wasn't covered by insurance. And then five months later, on the 11th of December, at 6.30 in the morning, the Bunsfield oil refinery in Hemel Hempstead exploded. And with that explosion, it wiped out all the windows in our head office, and it wiped out, it caused severe damage to our call center. And our call center and the office, we couldn't access for five days. This is sort of pre-internet days. And so a lot of our booking, a large part of our booking was still done by phone. Within 24 hours, we had to set up a makeshift call center in the spa, but we couldn't handle the bulk of the calls. And so we ended up the season losing 25% of our sales because of that. Now, when we finally got into the building, there was glass everywhere there was rubble, there was a mess. And when I walked around the call center, what I saw were big shards of glass harpooned into desks, into computers. 
And if the if the disaster had happened, if the explosion had happened a couple of years, a couple of uh, hours later, a number of the call centre staff would have been in. So it was a disaster, but nobody died, and that's the important thing that I sort of took out of it on the first day back into the the business. What it did for us as a business, though, was it severely hit our cash flow. And the insurance company uh, didn't resolve issues for about three months. And during that three months, we weren't allowed to touch, apart from clear up, we weren't allowed to touch much. We didn't have any money to, to do all of the refurbishment to the call center. So for three months, we um, worked in a building that had no windows. We were holed up, boarded up, and there were gaps in the walls, um, which made recruitment very, very difficult. But looking back on it, uh, I think it made us a better business. I think as a result of the disasters, we were far more, uh, we made decisions quicker, we acted quicker, and we were far more focused on cash and on costs. And as a team, we were in sort of a bunker off the M1, two miles away from your nearest cappuccino or your sandwich shop. It wasn't the most glamorous of beauty businesses. But because we were holed up in this place, we had nowhere to go and no light, that actually it made us stronger as a team and more determined to succeed. So for all of you, as you start out on your businesses, you probably will get to have some setbacks. You probably will have some bad luck. But how you respond to the bad luck may in fact define your success. Thank you. Oh, try one. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that right before the advert, you were looking at several businesses to buy and decided <coughs> not to. So what is it that you look for when you're looking to buy a business? Do you have like more of a value investor or <coughs> profit approach? Are you looking for growth? Should I tell you the honest answer? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I instinctively look to see whether there's an opportunity with a brand and then I rationalize it in a sort of consultant way. So I look for, I, I'm a, I, I like brands, I can build brands, and I look for a brand and a product that meets a consumer need. And it's as simple as that. Okay. So it's whether I'm working on a big brand like Johnny Walker, I try to look for the insight from a consumer on how to position Johnny Walker whether it's it or if it's something like the sanctuary, I look to see the product has a need, it meets a consumer need, and there's something about the brand that I can build. And how do you see those things? I don't know. <laughs> I think about consumers. I go around, I think about consumers, I think about markets. I do. I am investing. I do. There's one beauty technology business which takes technology from Swansea University in um, IPL technology, uh, intense pulse light, and it's used for. Uh, it's a startup, and it was used for um, hair removal, skin rejuvenation, and acne. And you would look to understand the technology behind the business completely. Uh, uh, Flutter's probably a better example. I looked at that and I thought. Actually, it's an outstanding idea because you're using emerging technology to create a marketplace, a marketplace which takes away the place of uh, the middleman, the betting shop. And it's because of that, I didn't know anything about the technology. I didn't know what it would take to scale the business. I didn't know what it would take to build the site. I didn't know any of that, but it's, it's hard. I thought it was a, I thought it was a great idea. And that's why I joined it. So that's how I'd evaluate technology businesses. It meets a consumer need. And what the technology does is it transforms the business. It takes away the need for the middleman. I'll come to you next. Yeah. Great. So um, before you started running the, uh, the um, sanctuary, not sanctuary, the business uh, selling sunglasses. Yeah. Sunglasses. Yeah. Glasses. Yeah, sunglasses. Yeah. Sunglasses. Yeah. Um, you had been a consultant. I had, I had. All, all your career after that point? No, I started off in advertising. Okay. I started off in advertising and then I was headhunted by Bain, <coughs> went to Bain. Bain then sponsored me through business school. But in light of your comment uh, later that you said you, um, flawless execution was absolutely key 
yeah. your business yeah. strategy was secondary. Yeah. What gave you the confidence? In our business, because it was a super simple strategy. Yeah. So what gave you the confidence uh, to step out of the consulting world and put your and, and focus on running a business in, a, in an industry <coughs> that presumably you didn't know very much about at that point? Uh, that's a good question. Um, a combination of frustration on the one part and determination to succeed on the other. So, as you can see, the reason I went through my career is you can see I flip-flop between the two because there's something very fulfilling about a corporate job and very secure about a corporate job. And if you can do it and do it quite well, it's quite a big thing to give up. And so um, I didn't know I could, I, I, I never in my wildest dreams thought the sanctuary would be as successful as it was and build such a big business in such a short period of time. I, I, you know, the business plan was far more modest than that. But because I'd spent a year trying to buy the license back, I looked at the business and understood it in great detail. And then the decision I had to make was is my next best alternative working in a corporation better than what I think I can do with this? And at that point, it was, a, you know, in lots of ways, a crazy decision. I had two small kids. Or, you, know, I, you know, the last thing I needed to do was be, you know, run this business. But there was just something in me that went, actually, I think I'm going to enjoy this much more. I think there's an opportunity. I'm going to take the risk. So... And, I, and, and, you know, I'm, the reason I did go through my background is I'm not one of these straightforward, you know what, I'm going to risk it all, I'm going to go out and start up a business. Sorry, you, you, you had your hand uh, yeah. up before, I, sorry. I want to ask you, in relation to all this success that you had in 2008, what, what's your next uh, aspiration or ambition in terms of having, doing business? Uh, well, since then, I've gone into, I've been exec chair of a skincare <coughs> cosmetics business in uh, Finland. It's 100 million turnover. So I've done that for the last three years. And I've also done some investing in smaller businesses. Um, Is that by yourself or through a... Combination, combination. So um, I, I look for opportunities. If, if an opportunity for a business came up that I, that I thought was great and I could add some value to it, I would either choose to do it as a chair or as a CEO. Thank you. I'm, not, I'm not hugely planned, as you can probably tell. <coughs> yeah. I want to follow up on the point that you make on um, doing this startup as a better alternative to corporate. Yeah. Usually people say that they, you need to be really, really passionate in order to succeed because uh, being an entrepreneur is really hard. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. At what point were you really excited about a business? Because it, it seems based on your story that you liked it, but maybe did, were you passionate from the first moment? Um, was I passionate? For, uh, no, uh, 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 the sanctuary products. Um, no, I wasn't passionate about it. I looked at it because I was trying to buy back the license. I spent a lot of time looking at it. And then um, the private equity company said, oh, we need to do commercial due diligence. So um, I said, I don't think you need to do a big deck of consumer due diligence. I think there's one question we need to, to ask. And the question we need to ask is, is this a product that consumers love and buy for themselves? Or is this going to be another body shop, which is it's a product that people buy to give to their aunt or to somebody else? And there's loads of people in the country that got a whole load of this in their cupboards but aren't using it. And um, the company that did the consumer research did a fantastic job. And they came back and they said, this is a brand. This is a product that people really love and are buying it for themselves or buying it for people that they love, either a friend or a sister. And, uh, but it is a bit tired. It's dated, you know, all the rest of it. And the final line that they wrote on the report, which the guys subsequently said, oh, I don't remember writing, was, uh, it's a tad exciting question mark. And that's unusual for most people who do this kind of research. And I thought, mm, actually, it is a tad exciting. I looked at all the data and I thought, actually, there is something in this brand. There is something that we can do with this. And it was that report that made me think, you know what, instead of just putting the two businesses together and selling it as a combined unit, there's the opportunity to build it.
Uh, yeah, but yes. I think they've done a great job. So uh, the spa was uh, the spa in Covent Garden was closed two years ago because for property development. Uh, the team that are running the spa is, is m the person who's running it now as product and marketing director is, is a person from my old team. I think the whole way they've evolved it into uh, a mission to help women let go, I think, is is good. It's good, and it's still growing. I guess because every brand has a story, and the story evolves. Yeah. Even when you let go of it, it becomes something new. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I still feel I still feel very passionate about the sanctuary. Yeah. Um, you mentioned one of the second key points about what you've learned. And yeah. You mentioned about have finding a partner. Yeah. I've heard many people that say, you know, I can't start my business because I don't have a, I haven't got a co-founder. Yeah. How and what is your advice in terms of like, you know, people that uh, to get started or how to kind of find that partner that. I don't know how you go about finding a partner. Some small startup businesses go out and try and look for a chair. Some try and recruit a really good finance director. I, I was lucky because um, Linda had already been in the private equity company. And it was only as I went through the journey with her that I realized how useful and how helpful she had been along the way because she had very different skills. And so the things that if I was facing them all on my own, I would have been a bit nervous about. Would you have still done it? Uh, good, good question, actually. Uh, probably. Probably. Okay. I think that's good. I, 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 get, I ask, ask that question. I think a lot of people find it quite um, difficult to give an answer. I think what you do, it makes you, it makes you far, far stronger when you've got mm -hmm. a partner, and it means you can tackle. Um, problems and issues that come up with the business because you've got a, a broad range of complementary skills and you're both in it together. Um, yes? So, how did you go from being an MA in classics to being a business? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not obvious, is it? It's not obvious when you're trying to work in the States either. Um, uh, I did. I, I was at Cambridge. I did classics. I did philosophy. At Cambridge, I ran a radio, the radio station. I always thought I was going to go into the media. Um, and then I got a summer job in an advertising agency and then uh, started applying to advertising agencies. Um, and so that's how I went. I went into advertising and then I got headhunted for uh, management consultancy. Uh, the one thing I would say about classics is... Um, uh, Advertising is quite creative, it uses a different part of the brain. Um, consultancy is very analytical, but actually when you do classics, it's actually a very analytical study. So I think the skills that I learned in doing classics and philosophy actually helped in consulting. Yes? Um, a small question about people's sides yeah. when you run your business. Yeah. Okay. Okay. When people are going to take a big leap and join you in a bunker on the M1 for a lot less pay and not much, you know, not, you know, not an immediate sense of what the prospects are, you've, you've got to try and sell them the vision. And that's what I did. I, I did a little, you know, this is where we're going. And if this works out, this is what it means for you financially as well. So I had a little model. Um, but the main reason why people joined was um, they bought into the vision. The vision of what we could create. And I didn't take people up to the bunker. I, didn't, I interviewed people in London. Because <laughs> there was one person that I got from Body Shop who, um, she said, you know, it's, it was fantastic. She said, but when I first turned up, because I hadn't actually been to the office, I didn't realize that it would just be me and I had no team, and I wouldn't actually see the light of day for the whole of th the first three months of working. Uh, yep. Um, I have a question related to your consulting experience. Yeah. Do you think it was necessary uh, for your entrepreneurship and for your regulatory career? 
Um, I found consulting, I found the experience I had at Bain, the training I had at Bain was invaluable. Um, I think it gives you a level of analytical rigour and confidence actually in, in going into a business and assessing its potential. Yeah. So for me, I, I, it worked for me. Over here, yeah. Which marketing side of things? So you said that you were focusing on, on Christmas and, and doing yeah. magic. What, what yeah, did you yeah. do to validate that that was worth taking so much of a risk on, arguably? Uh, yeah, OK. Would be, um, what did you find were the key negotiation points that you were able to skip to to do the big retailers when you were okay. wanted? Yep. And the final part would probably be whether you developed any sort of behavioural interview um, questions that you found that over time Okay. Um, okay. The first one was the first marketing. marketing, and how did I figure out about gift vouchers? Um, uh, I did. I did a little piece of research amongst the people who came to the spa, and I found that they absolutely loved the experience of going for the day. And there were bits in the day they didn't like, and that's what focused me on trying to change those bits. Um, they would come to the spa more often if they didn't feel guilty about paying for it and taking the time off. The way they didn't feel guilty about it is if somebody else bought it for them. And once I found that, I thought, OK, well, we could really grow this business. It's a really easy uh, gift for a man to buy. Um, and women want it. So if we focus on gifting vouchers, we should be able to drive much more revenue because it's not relying on a woman trying to fork out that amount of money with all the guilt that's associated with that to try and buy it for themselves. So that's what, that's what led to that. Um, and then we did one of the most simple pieces of marketing was a second insight, which is men know that they shouldn't buy the same present twice, but women prefer them to buy the best, the, the, the present a second time because they prefer that to having a rubbish present. <laughs> so what we did was, and there was that whole thing about how do you say to the man, actually, I'd like it again, and, and the man's got to feel, oh, it's OK to buy it again. I'm not going to get told off. So what we did was we created little, little um, postcards. And um, in the sanctuary, if you filled out the postcard and sent it as a thank you, uh, we'll post it for free. And on the, we'd have funny things on the outside of the postcard, like it's OK to buy it again for me, having a great time. Yeah, it's better than this, better than tick box, this, this, this that you've given me. So that was great. So, so uh, we ended up getting quite a lot of repeat purchase so that was in the gifting uh, sorry the second question negotiation um, I didn't put that down as a key success but negotiation with the retailers particularly boots was was a key driver in the success of the business um, data is really important so I remember when we, when we first um, first started negotiating <coughs> with boots we accounted for about 30 percent of the sales in the category but we had about 15 percent of the fixture and then I analysed the profitability of um, our section and went back to Boots and said, uh, you need to give us more space. And by giving us more space, your whole category will be more profitable. Um, and if we don't get space which is commensurate with what I think the potential of the brand is, we will um, we'll break the exclusivity and go nationwide. So that was important. Second, I always think a negotiation is a two-way, a win-win. And so I said, actually, this is what our plan is. Our plan is to build this kind of scale. This is how we're going to support the brand. And this is the level of innovation we're going to, come, we're going to put into the brand. By doing that, we will turn around your declining category, which we did do. So that's how I did that. And uh, on retailers, on, on the other side is once you're strong, you have more negotiation. When you're a startup, or you're not particularly strong, you've got no negotiating power with the retailers. So be strong. So, but the first bit was about understanding what we deliver to them and then trying to develop a win-win. Um, in terms of questions on interviews, I, d I, don't have, I don't have any specific killer question, uh, but I spend a huge amount of time on trying to get the right people. 
and and the best way I found is just is is to use one's network. Yep. Um, I had a question. Um, if you do things differently now, so obviously now, like you just mentioned, the PT and grooming brands, like yeah. going into boots is like virtually impossible for yeah, yeah. So yeah. you've got direct to consumer now. Like, would you do yeah. things differently? Um. Boots is, is different to when we first started anyway. Um, I think what Boots for a Mastige product does um, is it gives you immediate visibility and presence, which is really difficult to do to build up online. I think I'd, I'd use a far greater combination of distribute routes to market now, because Boots isn't as dominant now as it used to be. Uh, but I would still have a very big retail presence with a Mastige brand of our scale. And there's lots of other things I do differently, just generally, but you know, there's, there's no point in regretting. Yes? Uh, just on uh, the product itself, uh, yeah. you emphasize the quality yeah. of the product. Did you um, outsource that to a contract manufacturer? Yeah, or? yeah everything. So when I said we, uh, a key part of the success was changing the supply chain, we changed the supply chain from a contract manufacturer who accounted for about 90% of our production to a manufacturer who was able to meet us on innovation. So we knew what we wanted, but could actually deliver the innovation, could deliver it with in short runs and uh, in short periods of t in, with a short lead time. Uh, and that became really critical for us because when we're churning out lots and lots of innovation, we needed small batches and we needed short, um, short delivery times, short lead times. No, we did two things. So the first manufacturer that we, the, the incumbent manufacturer was one manufacturer in Preston. And then I split the uh, supply chain and had a, um, a manufacturer in the UK for our main core lines. Uh, I had another manufacturer that would take our stable core lines that didn't change. So long runs uh, didn't change. And then um, I went and got a, a different contract manufacturer actually based in Thailand to do our gift, not to do our gift packaging, because we source that directly ourselves, but to take the gift packaging, put it into Thailand, and then they were able to create the beauty, uh, basically do assembly, assembly and do the wet, the wet product. One more question. Oh, there aren't any now. Ah. Okay, I can answer the second one. I can answer the second one first, which is, uh, go on. Okay, um, on the alcohol, it's a really, really easy one. You're going, to, you're going to spend a day with your friend, you're going to be spending a lot of time sitting around chatting, you're going to go in and out the pool, you're going to have a treatment, glass of champagne, alcohol, sort of makes sense, doesn't it? So it wasn't my Diageo experience at all. I just thought, you know, there's no point in feeling trying to be healthy and virtuous on a day when you're actually trying to feel indulged and pampered. Um, so the LBS brand, I have to say, uh, in 1988, I didn't think about the LBS brand. And the reason why I didn't think about the LBS brand was um, Bain had said to me, OK, well, fund you go to business school. You've got to go to business school. Um, your choice. And I didn't really want to go to business school. So I took the shortest course and one that was in France because I like I like France. So, so <laughs> I have to say, I didn't look at any other business schools. And the third question was, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it was very much part of our, which I think I answered about the marketing question. It's very much part of our proposition that there is a gift voucher um, because it allows women to take this time off and not feel guilty about it. So I would definitely go for gift vouchers. The, obviously, the route to market, the distribution strategy would be very different now because there's so many more people who are consolidators for the spa gift vouchers now. And I think it'd be far more competitive and more difficult. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you.